sticker right behind my head. Good morning, welcome to Tasman, BC. Um, we have two very interesting talks on in this session, but first off, we have Jack Moffat from Mozilla, so this morning's keynote may be slightly related. Um, we're going to be talking about server architecture, safety, and performance, so let's make him feel welcome. Thanks, everyone. So I want to tell you guys why Servo is fast um, and why it's awesome. But to do that, I have to start a, a, a long time ago, um, in 1994. So if you were around in 1994, you might have enjoyed the arrival of one of the early web browsers, <laughs> Netscape Navigator. And if you were so fortunate as to use this beautiful thing back then, you might have installed it on your computer. And inside that computer, you, you might have had a processor like this one, the original Pentium. So this had about three million transistors in it. Um, when Firefox first got released in 2002, you might have upgraded to a Pentium 4. And they added about 50 million transistors to this CPU. And you can see, aside from a little bit of hyper-threading when they brought that on, most of these transistors are there to make Firefox faster. It's awesome. Unfortunately, this was not to last. Um, by 2008, we have these, this is the original core i7. We have multiple cores. Now we added another approximately 700 million transistors here, but unfortunately not all of them will make Firefox faster. Um, so actually, very few of them probably went to making Firefox faster. And the rest of them made your other things on the computer faster, which was not helpful. <laughs> so, it's okay, we're all engineers, we can solve this problem. What we'll do is we'll use threads um, and we'll write multi-threaded parallel algorithms and we'll make Firefox faster that way and we can finally use all of the rest of the 700 million transistors that we got added. Unfortunately, C++ makes this hard. So parallel algorithms are already hard because you have to deal with synchronization and data, data being shared and all of these kinds of things which make your life uh, more difficult. But C++ does not help you here at all. Like, everything you do is completely dangerous, will result in probably, you know, evil people taking over your computer and spying on you naked. So, this seems like a bad situation. Some people at Mozilla were like, maybe we can do something about this. So we had this idea. Let's rewrite C++ and then use that to rewrite a browser. We have really big yaks at Mozilla. <laughs> So, why is, so the goal of Servo is to like use all of this 700 million transistors and how we do it is through these sort of four-ish things. Um, so we do parallel style computation, we lay out the page in parallel, um, we organize the work that the browser does in sort of a novel way which we call the constellation and then we move painting to the GPU with web render and we have some other stuff that we're working on that's not quite ready for a full presentation mode yet. So two years ago I was here and I talked mostly about the first two. So this time we'll get to learn about the rest. So let's start with the constellation. So to understand the sort of what we're doing with the organization of processes and threads and stuff inside of Servo, it's helpful to go back and see how people did this before and how that evolved over time. So we'll start with single process monolithic engines, which is what that original Netscape probably was. So basically the browser engine sort of sits in the middle, nice process, you stick HTML and CSS and JavaScript in one end and you get graphics out the other. Um, you know, everyone can write one of these, it's pretty easy, it fits on one slide. Um, <laughs> but you know, you might want to look at one, more than one web page at a time, so what we did is we used some cooperative multitasking and we got all the tabs and we actually, you know, end up writing the browser front end in, in JavaScript as well, so that's got to run in the same engine and so the same engine is sort of going back and forth between doing all the tabs in your browser plus the browser itself. And that's where we were until about the time Chrome came along and they decided, like, we can use multiple processes for this. And so it looks a little bit like this. You have the same basic setup, except now, you know, we can put all of the browser's implementation JavaScript in one process and all of the content, you know, the different pages and tabs that you're running in your browser in another process. And uh, the nice thing about this is now they won't fight. Like, if one, if the JavaScript for the page that you're viewing is really slow, the browser won't slow down and vice versa, although hopefully the browser is not 
poorly written in the first place. Um, and you can also extend this to like any number of processes. So generally there's a, a pool of these. I think Chrome probably has around 10 or something. Uh, Firefox with E10S currently uses one extra one like this picture. Um, but we're moving to a model that has this picture. And then you can sort of uh, round robin, put the tabs in, you know, various number of processes. And sort of the big benefit of this is that if something causes a failure, like you have some JavaScript code that trips a bug in a DOM API, you only lose that whole process. Don't know what happened to the actual picture there. Well, so just that whole bottom part will turn red and it goes away, but you can see the browser JavaScript and stuff is still running, and if you have multiple of these processes, only some subset of your tabs disappear and die and need to be reloaded. Um, we can also make this more secure by using sandboxing. Okay, this is, this is not good. Where are my beautiful slides? There we go. Okay, so now we can do sandboxing where the JavaScript process itself, like for the browser, has some privileged operations. It can read and write files and all that kind of stuff. But we can run unprivileged versions of all of the content that's running in the web pages. So this makes your life much safer. Um, and this is what Chrome does now, what Firefox is starting to do now. But we can do better. What instead of using multiple processes for this, because that has a lot of overhead, we instead run these things in threads. So no one actually does this yet, I don't believe, but um, as we'll see later, Firefox has sort of moved this direction and Servo does this already. Um, you basically have the exact same model, except you have you know, one sort of JavaScript engine thread uh, per, per tab, and it all lives in the same process. Um, you can even extend this to multiple processes and get back the sandboxing that we had just a minute ago by, by just running multiple threads in the untrusted tab. So this, this makes, your, uh, makes the same, it's just as safe as the other way, but now we have a lot less overhead and it's a little nicer. So we get more responsive uh, pages because they don't interfere with each other. Um, we get sandboxing because now we can uh, shuffle you know, untrusted JavaScript code that we're downloading on the internet willy-nilly and running it without looking at it off into something that hopefully can do no harm. And we also have a way to sort of trap failures. Like if something bad happens, the process goes down, like the Flash plugin causes, you know, some tabs to be lost, but not all the tabs, and we're happier. But is this the best we can do? And of course, Betteridge's law says the answer is no. And what we can do here is we can apply even more parallelism. So we have this great idea, like what if we actually split up this one sort of execution unit into multiple things that can run independently? Like what if we can get JavaScript to run and the layout and graphics stuff to run all at the same time? Wouldn't that be great? And we call this the pipeline. So a pipeline has basically two threads. So it has a script thread that's running JavaScript code as a layout thread which takes, you know, the result of, we call them flows, the result of what the script task does and, and turns it into display lists for, um, to be painted. And so the nice thing is about this is if you have a page that takes a lot of work to lay out, you don't have to wait for that to get done. As soon as your JavaScript, you know, finishes processing its event, it can, you know, fire off the flows to the layout thread and then go back to running the next JavaScript event. So hopefully your code gets to run faster here. And, and, you know, layout doesn't block what you're doing. Um, another side benefit of this is, well, this is a, uh, one of the many ways in which the web is terrible is that it's recursive and you can put a web page inside another web page forever. And so we can do the, the same thing. It's like we can have a pipeline for the outer page that has a child pipeline for the inner iframe, and now it has its own script thread, which means even within the same page, we can make it so one part doesn't interfere with another part or block the script execution of that part. So that may sound like, oh, well, what would we ever use this for? But let me show you something terrible. <laughs> so I've run ad blockers for years, and so I was not aware of the terribleness that exists, but I turned off my ad blocker and went to Ars Technica, and the ad is like most of the screen, which I found terrifying. But the thing here is this ad is actually an iframe, 
and it's cross-domain. And if there's any bad code from these advertising people or something going wrong, like in, a, in the existing browsers that we have, this will interfere with the stuff that you're trying to do. And in Servo, because we run the iframes in different threads from the main content of the page, that will run in a different thread, and no matter how bad it is, you'll probably still be able to do what you want to do on Ars Technica. Um, there are hopefully more uses for this than just uh, making ads uh, slightly less terrible. Um, but if you do want to do that, run an ad blocker too. Um, so that's so cross-domain iframes are just one kind of iframe, and they don't share any uh, state. So like uh, the the iframe can't like access a JavaScript <coughs> objects in its parent. But there are iframes that can do that. Um, I call them synchronous iframes here. And instead of having one script thread for both, we have to share the same script thread because it has a, a, the ability to mutate state in the in the parent frame or, or vice versa. But you still get two layout threads and one script thread. So this is still a nice improvement. Uh, now we can start talking about the constellation. So the constellation is the way we sort of organize the stuff that I've been showing you all into uh, one engine. So the constellation sort of sits out here on the side and manages collections of these pipelines. So these pipelines form a kind of tree. Um, they may have multiple iframe children because, you know, why wouldn't you want more web pages than your web pages? Um, and, and, and so it makes like sort of a nice structure. And the, again, the important thing here is that none of these things will interfere with each other except for, you know, general core contention on your computer. But like if there's a long run, like if somebody's doing a giant matrix multiplication for some reason in an ad to show you some crazy graphics, it's not going to make the, the browser stop being able to scroll, um, which I'm sure everyone would appreciate. And remember, before, if we had one page that caused some failure, it took out the whole process but only that one process. So like still the other, some of the other processes are running and maybe all your tabs didn't disappear. But Rust can fail better. So with Rust, we can trap failures at, most failures at thread boundaries. So if something fails here in this iframe, which is part of this other page, it takes out the script thread, but not the rest of the stuff. So the original page is still all there can still execute and do everything you want. The other iframe is still there and can do whatever you want. And we still have layout working for the thread that, for the pipeline whose script thread died, which means we can still let you scroll around in there and manipulate the page and sort of interact in a limited way. Um, and because we trap this at a thread boundary, we actually have stack traces. Uh, JavaScript can actually get access to why uh, the threads failed. And, um, and you can do all kinds of new UX here to handle the failure. You can put a little banner at the top saying, you know, this page had a script thread, you know, it, it, it had some kind of error. You should probably refresh it, but otherwise you're free to continue interacting with it, like if you need to cut and paste something out of it. So hopefully this is a big improvement uh, for people's lives. So we can still do sandboxing and security. Uh, this still gets preserved. Here is the way that, uh, you know, you can structure this whole thing. Um, the graphics engine and the constellation will run in a privileged main thread, and then we'll have an unprivileged uh, content process that runs uh, some arbitrary number of these pipelines. So now if something crashes uh, in one of these iframes, it can't uh, hopefully sneak out and do something mean on your, on your machine. And you can extend this even to multiple processes, although it's not entirely clear how best to do this yet. Um, you only really need one other process for the sandboxing purposes because you can run all of the tabs in their own threads and trap failures there. But it might be the case that one of the iframes is trying to attack another of the iframes and because processes share memory spaces, like this may not be the best situation. So you might want to somehow uh, put some some of the tabs in a different process so that even if there's a failure there, while they can't break out of the sandbox, they can't even attack uh, other tabs. Um, so I don't know whether we do this by putting evil stuff in a separate process or putting like banks in a separate process or whatever, but, but uh, we, we could get some extra security there somehow. Okay, so let's talk about web render. This is the fun one. Um, now remember this picture, this is the Core i7 and we added 700 million transistors uh, to the chip we had before, and, but then we had to figure out a way to use all these cores. But unfortunately, Intel engineers never sleep, and they added a billion transistors in those intervening years. 
And like not many of these transistors went to like making even servo faster. So this is a bad situation. Now, now we're back to the situation we had before where we're only using 60% of this beautiful processor and now we have to figure out some way to use this left uh, portion. So we need to use the GPU. So there's a couple nice things about using the GPU aside from the fact that we get to use the whole computer that we paid for, which is anything that we can move and do computation on the GPU is like free performance on the CPU. Like everything else gets faster just by magic. We don't even have to optimize it. It just has more resources to run and can be faster and things are great. And the other thing is GPUs are actually way faster at a bunch of stuff than the CPUs are in the first place. For instance, that, uh, you know, there were four cores in, in that, uh, um, what is it, Sandy Lake, uh, process, Sky Lake processor, but there are 24 GPU execution units, so it's even more parallel. And then lastly, um, you know, when you're, we're trying to think like which things to move to the GPU, like it might make sense to start with like the one that's in the name and, and try to move some graphics stuff there. People have had success with this in the past. So you might be asking yourself at this point, like, you know, GPU driver bugs are a common source of like browser crashes on all platforms. So clearly they're already using the GPU. So like, isn't this a solved problem? And it's true that like Firefox and Chrome and stuff will use the GPUs, but they use them in a limited way, mostly related to compositing. So they'll draw all of the uh, content of the web pages and layers on the CPU and then, you know, upload them as textures to the GPU and just squash them all together and blend them. And that makes doing some kind of the animations really fast, but it, you're still doing all of the work on the CPU side. So we set out to try to figure out if we could get all the rest of that work onto the GPU besides just the compositing. And so we started this web render project and some of the main things about it are we use retain mode instead of immediate mode. So immediate mode is like, I'm gonna set the pin color to black, I'm gonna draw a box, I'm gonna set the pin color to red, I'm gonna draw a different box over here, and then I'm gonna set the pin color to black and draw a box in a different spot. And this is kind of hard to optimize because what you really wanna do is minimize the state changes of like changing the pin color. So you'd like to set the pin color only the, you know, the minimum amount of times, which is two instead of three. Um, and so in retain mode, you know everything that you're going to draw before you start executing commands, and you can find the optimal ordering of the draw commands to minimize the state changes uh, and, and do nice things like that. So we, it turns out that web pages are sort of their own scene graphs. So you already have all the information that you need, all the state changes that you need to make and all that stuff, and we're just not using them now. So uh, can we use those and, and, and get some speed here? And the other thing is most of the, everyone here probably has used the graphics library at some point in their life and they're all very similar. They're like set the pin color to black, draw a rectangle with this line width and fill this fill color and stuff. And all of the painting programs that you use are sort of designed uh, in a similar way. But you know, the web only contains a fixed amount of things, fortunately for now, and there are not really that many of them. So we have text. This is actually the complete list of things web render can draw. This is almost everything you need to draw everything on the web. So we can draw text. We can draw a rectangle. We can have an image. We can have a border on stuff. We can have shadows on those things. We can have a gradient. And then all the other stuff is sort of like utility things that, uh, like there's iframe for that beautiful recursion that everyone asked for. Um, so there's not all that much to draw. Uh, so we can make a specialized library that can translate these items into things that we can do on a GPU and get more performance um, instead of having a generic 2D drawing library. And the other thing that we do is draw the whole frame every frame. So the, one of the reasons to do this is right now if you do animations on the web in JavaScript, like you'll find some things are really fast and some things are just really slow. And part of this is because all the current browsers do a whole bunch of work to invalid, like to figure out what is the actual area of the screen that you're changing, so we only repaint that one tiny area. Which is great because it means that if, you know, you're a blinking cursor in like the Atom text editor, all you're gonna change is those, that little rectangle on the screen where the cursor is. But then if you like have some big animation that moves stuff all over the screen, now we have to repaint the entire thing and that's way slower. So 
we can make the GPU renderer fast enough that we can repaint every pixel every time, and this means that there will be much less var variation in frame times for different kinds of content. It means everything will be fast. Or alternatively, you can think of it as everything is slow. But it's, 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 so, it's so fast that it, it's, it's so fast anyway that being slow uh, doesn't matter. The, the other thing here is all of that logic to figure out what is the area of the screen that actually changed is very expensive. Like there's some quick stuff you can do, but um, it, it d turns out that on real web pages there are edge cases where the time to figure out the region that changed is more than the frame budget that you have to get a new image on the screen. So, so like we've definitely seen web pages that have, you know, 20 milliseconds it, it takes just to figure out what to repaint, where, whereas to touch every pixel on the screen would have taken us, you know, 15. So, you know, it, it, it's pretty terrible. So actually they're finding that by removing some of the invalidation logic in Firefox and making it stupider, they're actually making it faster. <laughs> um, so we just figured we'll just remove all of that. So this is sort of an overview of the way the rendering pipeline works. We take the screen uh, and divide it up into 256 by 256 tiles, and then we go through all of the stuff in the display list uh, for a web page and decide, you know, which tile, which tile or tiles is it in? Can you actually see it? Like it may be occluded by something that's sitting on top of it. And then uh, some stuff like text, we have to do some CPU processing on, so we sort of fire off things that we'll have those ready for us by the time we get to rendering. Um, then we take that list for all the tiles and we merge it into a big tree and, and assign it render targets. Uh, and basically the idea is that we want to calculate the optimal way to dispatch draw commands to the GPU to minimize the state changes um, and to minimize the number of passes we have to make. And then we just execute all of those things. So I'll give you an example of sort of how this works for a couple of different of these items. So box shadow has sort of two steps to it. First of all, we have to draw the corner of the shadow on, on one of the uh, box corners, and we also draw one pixel extra of it on each side. And then we have a second pass that takes that corner that we already drew to some texture on the GPU and just rotates and copies it to the other three corners. And then we take that one pixel that we drew extra and we stretch it across both the horizontal and the vertical borders. And that's all we have to do. Uh, so we do a lot, a lot less drawing than, than, than you think. Most of it is just copying data around, which on the GPU is extremely cheap. Another one is text, which is slightly more complicated because, you know, we had to add shadows to them, uh, potentially. So when we're doing the tile assignment, like I said, we have to sort of request that, uh, we, we, basically no one has figured out yet although we'll see this isn't quite true anymore uh, in a few slides, how to do font rasterization on GPUs efficiently because GPUs don't draw curves very well. So what we do is we rasterize the fonts uh, on the CPU and upload them as G like big texture atlases to the GPU. And then the first thing that the GPU rendering for text does is go and take all the positions all these characters should be at and just copy them into the right places from the, from the glyph texture. Um, and then we have to do, uh, basically a Gaussian blur and separate it into two passes for the other two things. So this is like an example of, of a, 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 render, a render tree with like sort of two dependent uh, children. Now, you might wonder, what does this actually look like? So here is a demo of Firefox versus Servo. Um, oh, this is a different one. Uh, where's my mouse cursor? The servo is the one on the right, and you can see the graphics performance is much smoother than what we get out of Firefox as it does these transitions. So basically many things that we're getting, you know, single digit frames per second in current browsers, we're able to get 60 frames per second or more. Here's another one. This one was actually made by someone on the Chrome team comparing different browsers for this test that they created. So here's Google Chrome Canary, 15 frames per second. Firefox gets nine. It's looking pretty bad. WebKit is even worse with five. And then here's Servo, 60 frames per second. Um, no problem at all. So that's what you get when you get an extra billion transistors. OK. So that's web render. So that stuff uh, I just talked about is all in Servo Nightly now. You can play with it. Um, 
and stuff. So now I want to talk a little bit about Project Quantum. So Project Quantum is Mozilla's next generation web engine. And you can imagine, since Servo often described itself as the next generation web engine, that maybe these things are related. And so a, a large part of Project Quantum is taking technology that we made in Servo and putting it in Gecko. Um, there's some other stuff that they're doing besides that, uh, uh, which I'll talk about. So uh, these are the main pieces of, of Project Quantum. We have Quantum DOM, which is trying to do constellation-like things in Gecko. They're using C++ still and, and, and uh, you know, iterating over the engine they already have and restructuring it. Um, there's Quantum Style, which is taking the exact code from Servo and putting it into Gecko. Uh, you know, so this will be a big, huge chunk of Rust code shipping in Gecko later this year. And Quantum Render is taking Web Render, the work that I just showed, and putting that into Gecko as well. So pretty soon, hopefully, the Firefox and the server numbers will be identical on those benchmarks. So just to give you some idea of like how this is going to be, you know, experienced by a user, this is a build, a custom build of Firefox that is able to switch between the old Gecko style system and the one from Servo. The one from Servo is the one in the front, and the one in the back is Gecko. And you probably can't read the numbers, but uh, I think the one in Firefox takes about 130 milliseconds uh, to do style computation on this Barack Obama page, and the one in Servo takes 27. So it's you know a little over four times faster. And it turns out that style computation in particular, the algorithm we use is linearly scalable in number of cores. So if you had an eight-core machine, it would be eight times as fast instead of just four. So here's a, a sort of beefier example, which is the single page version of the HTML5 spec. This one takes about 1.2 seconds to render in Firefox, to just to do style computation, and it takes uh, 250, under 250 milliseconds with Servo Style Engine. So again, about uh, a little over four times faster. So in, in this particular case, I believe that uh, style computation is a large fraction of the total page load time, but I think when we ran the numbers, this turned out to take like a full second off of the page load time of this page in Firefox. Okay, so aside from all these beautiful things that I talked about, which are we're planning to ship uh, later this year, we do have a lot of stuff that's sort of in the early stages. So the first one I'd like to mention is Pathfinder, which is us trying to find a way to solve font rasterization on GPUs. Um, so this project just started uh, midway through last year, I think, and we've tried and failed several times to make it successful. We had a breakthrough sort of over the holidays, and you can see that we are now, we, this is a benchmark of, of rendering uh, all the glyphs from Arial at font sizes in a huge variety of ranges, and we are now faster than every font renderer we could find, either on the CPU or the GPU. So this is approximately four times faster than the fastest known GPU renderer that we were able to find, and quite a bit faster still than, than FreeType or Rafe Levine's Font RS, which is sort of a, a, free, uh, a font rasterizer he wrote from scratch in Rust. So this looks very promising. Hopefully we'll have this in, integrated in WebRender later this year, and we'll get rid of the, sort of the bit of CPU processing that we currently do for text, which means more performance for JavaScript. Another uh, project that we're sort of in the early stages of is called Magic Dom. And the idea here is, you know, while the SpiderMonkey team is always trying to make SpiderMonkey faster, and the other JavaScript engine teams are also doing the same thing, there's, there's been very little work on making the sort of interface between JavaScript and the C++ or Rust, uh, you know, implementations of DOM APIs have as little overhead as possible and be nice and fast. And we have a bunch of ideas about how this can be done. And we finally had sort of a concrete uh, proposal from an engineer uh, last year that we're going to uh, try to pull off. And, and the basic idea here is that in you know, all browser engines, like most of the DOM APIs are written in C++ or in server, they're written in Rust. And the JavaScript engine is running JavaScript code, and yet those JavaScript objects need to be able to call methods that are on the other side. And so there's a whole lot of like argument marshalling you have to do uh, and, and this kind of thing. And so, um, 
in the engines, they have these reflector objects. So you have like a JavaScript object that's implemented in C++, and the JavaScript engine needs to know about it, so you create this reflector object which has a pointer to the C++ side so it knows how to call methods on it and, and, and so forth. And in Firefox and I think in Chrome, these are created lazily when they're used. So like the first time you call a DOM API on an object, it'll create a reflector for that object and then execute things. In Servo, we create these all up front, but we realized maybe what we should do is just make them the same object. Um, JavaScript reflector objects have an optimization where they can store properties directly in the reflectors to make them faster. So there's all this extra storage just sort of sitting there waiting to be used. And so our idea was can we put, uh, you know, the, the DOM um, data for on the C++ side or the Rust side into the reflector, and now we don't have to have these two different allocations and two different objects that have to communicate with each other. And then we went one step further, which is instead of stuffing C++ or Rust data in that space, what if we stored the JavaScript representation of that data? So now when JavaScript accesses it, it's free. It's like already in the native format. There's no marshalling when you do this. And then we, we further had the idea that if you did that, uh, then you could also write some of the DOM API implementations in JavaScript and self-host them. And this is nice because you end up letting the JIT, JIT the DOM API implementations, as well as the user JavaScript code, which isn't currently possible in except in a small number of cases. Um, the self-hosting uh, work that uh, some people at Mozilla are doing, I think we self-hosted um, several of the date uh, prototype methods, and it was something like uh, 12 or 20 times faster um, when those were written in, in JavaScript. So if we could do something like that here, we could make uh, DOM accesses uh, substantially faster. So and then, of course, we have a lot of relationships with external universities and researchers trying to figure out more ways where we can go faster and be safer. Um, we're doing some machine learning work. Uh, we have some stuff on incremental computation, which is, you know, if you make one small change in the layout, you want to find out what is the minimal number of layout steps you need to do to uh, uh, create the graphics for that change. Um, we've, we've got a web Bluetooth implementation that some researchers uh, in Hungary have been working on, and we're working on some software transactional memory stuff for how, how to better get uh, concurrency or parallelism out of the sort of running JavaScript in one thread and layout in another thread. So there's quite a bit of sort of new stuff coming down the, down the line. So lastly, I want to talk about how you can get involved. Um, so building a strong community around this project is one of the most important piece, uh, one of the most important things to us. Um, and we were very happy to see this blog post written last year comparing the number of developers uh, for different browsers over time. And you can see that last year we actually passed WebKit in the number of unique developers, which is kind of amazing considering how, how young we are. So we spend a lot of time trying to grow the community and, uh, and nurture it so that this project remains a strong one uh, for the foreseeable future. So here's a bunch of things you can do to get involved. Our GitHub page, we have you know, IRC, a mailing list, um, you, if, you're, if you're not a Rust developer or, or don't wish to be, uh, but you do develop web pages, it, it would be very helpful for us if you, you know, downloaded a Servo Nightly, ran some content that you're the author of through it, and then report anything strange that you find. Um, and we also spend a lot of time curating new bu like bugs for, for first-time contributors uh, uh, for you know, basically any of the languages or skill levels that that uh, are applicable to Servo. So we have you know, Python bugs for managing infrastructure things. We have Rust bugs. Uh, there's stuff that's like deep C++ stuff when it, when it calls for interacting with one of those components like the SpiderMonkey engine. So there's, uh, we're happy to mentor people through, through any and all of those. Um, and this is the primary vector at which we've been able to grow the number of unique developers for the project. Okay, well thank you very much. Thanks for that. Um, we do have a bit of time for questions, if you're okay with yep. having people ask questions. So. so, as you see at a conference like this, with so many people using laptops and the likes, uh, you know, most of them have got Intel GPUs or some other GPU. Have you looked at the implications of using GPU on power consumption versus how you've been existing? Kind of existing code does this on the CPU? Are we actually seeing a benefit or is there actually an impact? 
So we haven't looked specifically at GPUs, but let me uh, generalize your question and answer that one, which has a better answer. Um, <laughs> you could ask the same question about using all of the cores in the chip as well. Uh, and, and we did do some research to look at power consumption of that. So the, the idea, the, the intuition that we're going from is that by using all of the cores, we'll get the work done faster and the cores can power down sooner and therefore save electricity. And uh, while, while I'm sure that's true, the, the way that we tried to measure this was is we took, I think, a, uh, like a, an Intel laptop and turned off Turbo Boost, which gets rid of about 30% of the clock speed of the processor, but also removes 40% of the power, power draw. And because Servo is doing all this stuff on all of the cores, we were able to make up all the performance loss. Like, we were able to perform more than 30% better through parallelism uh, than, than a normal browser would. And so, essentially, you can get the same or better performance even at 40% of the power draw and 30% of the clock speed. Uh, we're hoping that that will also apply to GPUs, but we haven't yet tested that. And how GPU agnostic is this, or is it purely Intel focused? It is pretty GPU agnostic. I believe it uses an OpenGL 3.1 profile. Uh, we sort of targeted low-end laptop integrated GPUs as sort of the baseline here. It obviously performs fine on the high-end NVIDIA GPUs, but we're really looking to make, uh, you know, the, it, it, we're wanting it to hit 60 frames per second even on mobile device GPUs. So by using Rust, you're making things more secure as well as all, everything you talked about here. But I'm wondering, since you're now using the GPU for a lot of operations, you've kind of opened yourself up to security holes in GPUs being a possible new exploit mechanism. So have you done any thought about that? So that's certainly true. So I have two answers for that. One is we can't really avoid this because WebGL is part of the web. So we already have access to the GPUs from untrusted JavaScript code that you download from any site on the internet. And, and ser <laughs> Servo's not going to really change that. Uh, so we have to support that. So we, we try to make that as safe as possible. Um, but that's not really the great answer to your question. The, the other thing to consider is that the way that current browsers use GPUs right now involves a lot of things like cross-process texture sharing. Because now when you have multi-process stuff and you're uploading these pixel buffers to the GPU, like they might be happening in different processes, but you all want them to get composited the same. And that's not a, a, a driver path that's very well executed. Um, and they, they don't really test it. So th there's a lot of GPU driver bugs we find in that stuff. Whereas the web render implementation is very similar to how game engines are designed. And we're hoping that that means that it'll be on the happy path for GPU drivers and we'll have fewer GPU driver bugs. And then the last answer to that question is that uh, I believe this just got turned on in Firefox Nightly, but we now have a separate GPU process just like Chrome does where the, all the GPU commands run over there except for WebGL, I believe. And so if there is anything that goes wrong, at least it's isolated to another process and we can restart it. It doesn't help the security implications because that's obviously unprivileged, but at least it doesn't take down the whole browser anymore. Uh, how are you doing uh, inter-process communication? Because obviously you've got unprivileged and privileged processes and they need to be able to talk to each other. So what are you using for IPC and how are you dealing with that? Because you're obviously moving like whole frames from the rendering pipeline back to web render and things like that. So the rendering stuff, we send a display list across uh, IPC, but we don't actually send any rendered pixels. Like we upload uh, the batch, we basically batch all the GPU commands that would take to draw those display list items and upload those to the GPU. So any sort of uh, image data would be sort of on the GPU side. Um, for other things like the display list and things like that, we have a, a project we call IPC channel, which is basically an implementation as close as we can get to Rust's uh, channel uh, primitives that does inter-process communication. So the big feature of this as opposed to most IPC stuff that you can find is you can send a channel over the channel. Uh, just like in Rust, you can send channels over the channels. There's some limitations, so it's not quite as good, but it's as close as we were able to do with uh, um, cr cross-platform IPC technologies that exist. I mentioned mobile. I was wondering how far away is this from um, implementations for mobile? Like, is it mostly applicable? Is it going to be a lot more work to get it working on? Servo in general or WebRender specifically? 
Uh, well, I guess both. Like in terms of the plans for I, what you mentioned was I take it for the desktop Firefox, but in terms of Firefox on Android, it, are there plans to start doing the same thing there as well in terms of pulling in bits of server and web render? So I believe that all the Firefox stuff will use, like if it's going to switch to web render, it probably will also switch on Android. I don't know if that's going to be in the very first version. We do already have it running on Android. We have server builds for Android, and web render has always worked on Android uh, pretty much. I mean, like I said, we sort of target, we had that in our minds as a target. Now, in general, for servo, even though we have an Android build, you might ask, like, is it as good? Um, all the perf performance benefits that I've discussed are sort of magnified on mobile because the CPUs are a lot slower, but they still have multiple cores. And, and so in general, you should get even more relative speed up than a desktop machine. So when we you know, finally release you know, server 1.0 and everyone's downloading this to use on their desktops, they might, want, they might go, oh, this is, you know, everything is fast, but you know, it's not as fast. But if they use it on a mobile phone, then they'll sort of get the full effect. Uh, What's the medium to long term plans for the Servo project? In the keynote today, we had a talk about you know, gracefully shutting down projects. Is Servo going to gracefully shut down, or is Servo going to cause Firefox to gracefully shut down? Th well, well, thankfully, I have some evidence that we're not gracefully shutting down. Well, not this one. Where is it? We're, 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 we're hopefully going into the hockey stick phase um, that, that, that the Persona project unfortunately missed. Um, we're, right now we're spending a lot of time helping the Gecko uh, team integrate pieces of Servo into Firefox. We're continuing, uh, like the projects I showed you, in finding new ways to extract performance. Um, and those pieces will continue to be developed. The, the nice thing about this is because we're using the exact same code from Servo in Gecko for the style system and for web render, we have now you know, tripled or quadrupled the size of the team working on those components because now every Gecko platform engineer who works on CSS or graphics is also a servo engineer working on uh, CSS and graphics. So that's the kind of healthy relationships we're trying to sustain. We don't yet have a lot of external to Mozilla, um, I would say. We have a core team and there's, there's all the people on the core team are currently Mozilla employees, but we want to grow the core team uh, beyond Mozilla such that it has sort of healthy stewardship um, on its own. So the servo project, the, the medium to long-term plan is to continue uh, just as we are. We hope to have a, you know, a shipping browser as well that supports the whole web, um, not just as a feeder for tiny pieces into Gecko. So uh, we, we continue to work towards that goal. Um, do you see uh, the entirety of Firefox being the relevant bits being rewritten in Rust eventually, or is that going to be a separate project? So we're taking a kind of incremental approach. So we've actually re already replaced several small pieces of Gecko with Rust code. The MP4 metadata parser is now in Rust. It runs side by side with the current C++ code, but they're not implementing any new features in C++. So as soon as there's a new uh, feature added, it will be Rust only, and there will only be a Rust MP4 metadata parser. That same thing is happening also with the URL parser in Gecko, which has had security vulnerabilities in the past. Uh, we're hoping to make that safer. Um, that, I think that stuff will be in a Firefox release very soon, like in 12 weeks or so, um, but I don't have the exact date handy. Um, we're replacing a couple of major components, as you saw, and the question is, what about the rest of it? So some of the stuff is very hard to replace because the way Servo does things is really different than the way Gecko does things. Um, so in the case of CSS and Web Render, those are fairly stable interfaces that we were able to, uh, you know, just just replace. Um, next after CSS will probably be the layout stuff from Servo putting into Gecko. But currently Servo layout, like Servo CSS parser can do any CSS on the web. But, but of course it doesn't need to know anything about all the CSS properties, just how to parse them and cascade them. But it, when we're talking about layout, like we need to be able to support Flexbox and Grid and all of the layout algorithms that the web includes, which we don't have support for all of them. So that project will be much more extensive because we'll have to add a bunch of new functionality to the server layout engine before it can be integrated. 
Um, and then there's a whole bunch of, of the rest of the stuff, the network stack, uh, you know, the TLS library, the, um, the DOM implementation. It's unclear right now how best to go forward uh, moving that stuff to Rust. But in general, any new code that they're doing, they're evaluating like whether that makes sense to do in Rust instead of C++. And in several cases, there's projects already sort of uh, on, on the shipping path um, to getting that out there. So hopefully over time, we'll, we'll transform it into a, a safer, faster browser. Um, uh, and, and sort of the idea is like you don't want to shut down all Firefox development and then add all that stuff to Servo and then start again because none of the other browser vendors are going to wait for us to sort of get there. So we just do them and we try to get as much over to the Firefox side as we can while we continue to make uh, a Servo browser and, and you know even if one day Servo doesn't get all the way there, like we, we will be able to reap the benefits of this technology years before. And that's all the time we have. Let's thank Jack again.